Okay, so uh, we're going to start the second one. Rick Miller's going to do a presentation on uh, case study on one of the um, high energy centres in Sydney. 2011. 2011. Uh, Rick's with the RFS, uh, Fire Rescue RFS. In Note on the uh, door saying uh, fire investigators in the area, uh, watch out. <coughs> so there was nobody answering the door. I went up to where the fire was and was walking up the hill about uh, 200 metres and came to this little grove of trees. And just as I came in, this big dingo came roaring straight past me. And uh, I turned around to get a shot of it. And the other two uh, dingoes left either side of me. So uh, I've been mauled by dingoes, I think. Case study is not really uh, uh, for uh, an audience of fire investigators. We've made it up really for the fire, um, the firefighters in the Lakes team. Um, that's uh, the brigades in Lake Macquarie and Wild. It's um, it's really about protecting and preserving the incident scene. Uh, over the last four years, Stuart and I have uh, taken a protect and preserve incident scene. Course from the Rural Fire Service to all the brigades in our area, and we've noticed that there's been a great improvement in uh, the scene preservation over that time. And so our investigations are, uh, you know, a lot fewer of them are undetermined as a result. But um, in the RFS, that's the only course uh, that's uh, mandated, and so if you've done that course, uh, most people do just after their basic training. Uh, you can go through 20 years of firefighting without ever revisiting any of the principles or strategies or tactics that are associated with it. So um, what we wanted to do was to get a way of getting into the brigades and having a, a chat uh, to them and refreshing the, the principles. And so we came up with uh, <coughs> case studies. Now, uh, the, a case study uh, has a other advantages as well, like a, a firefighter who goes to a, a major incident that um, uh, involves a police, police prosecution and then a court case. Uh, it, it's like going to, it's like reading a book without the last two chapters in it. You know, you can, you can go and do all your work and then you won't know anything about it until uh, about two or three years later when the court case is, uh, is finished. So for these sort of things, we going to choose case studies that have uh, been significant to uh, the firefighters and take, uh, take that to them. So this one, uh, the Allison Museum, uh, I've chosen, I've shown it to some of you before, but it's, um, uh, it had an enormous amount of evidence in it and it uh, had a lot of significance in the district and uh, it was also really well done. Um, so I'm not going to uh, go over this as I would uh, for the brigades. I'm just going to show you what, uh, what's in our course and, uh, uh, and uh, at the end of it I'll see, you know, see whether it's, uh, you think it's worthwhile uh, doing yourself or uh, you're welcome to use this one. The role of the RFS uh, investigator is just to, to um, do origin and cause job of the police actually is to uh, collect evidence and to act on that to find people who are responsible. But uh, the firefighters are first on scene and so they have that first responsibility. If they stuff that up then, then it's gone. The evidence is gone. And so uh, we, we emphasise to them how important their role is. And also when they're fighting a fire uh, the, the, the less damage they do the better it is for FIs because, uh, of course, we, uh, we showed them in this uh, how some of the fire patterns uh, help us to determine areas of origin. Now, this 
this was a very unusual fire, both uh, for the amount of evidence and also the construction of the building. So uh, Will, William Allison came to uh, uh, the Wyong district in 1875. He'd actually married uh, one of the daughters of William Cox, the uh, person who built the, uh, or supervised the road across the Blue Mountains. And there was a lot of uh, Cox descendants in uh, Wyong and also on the other side of the mountains as well. Uh, his son Charles, uh, or William Allison, took over uh, three land grants uh, for the Cape Brothers, I think, who started Sydney Grammar. Uh, and they became the largest landowner. They had virtually owned all of Wyong they gave some of the land uh, uh, back uh, to people to actually build the, uh, the village of Wyong itself. His son Charles, uh, built the Allison Homestead about 1885, went uh, broke in about 1890 in the Great Depression of the 1890s, and the uh, farm was all then divided up into and sold off in, in small lots. The Allison Homestead uh, uh, became a much smaller area that was used for M1 freeway, or the F3 freeway, goes through the place, and uh, when that was built, uh, the, uh, the land became less usable and was taken over by the council, and uh, in 1998 they made it a museum to store a lot of the uh, early records of, uh, of uh, European settlement in the district. When it was burnt down in 2011, it contained uh, about $500,000 old maps and records and journals um, that people had donated. They were all in, the, in that area there. Uh, and also uh, a lot of the, uh, the records of the contact be between the Europeans and the Aboriginal uh, uh, tribes of the area, the uh, Banjo, not the Banjo, um, Darkinjo, uh, Wabakal and Garibald. The RFS were notified uh, about uh, 3.46 hours, fire and rescue about 3.40 naturally, and uh, <laughs> uh, they both responded. It's in an RFS district, and uh, the uh, firefighters found the main section of the building were right. Uh, they quickly realised the fire investigation was needed, got us out, and uh, the uh, professionalism of the firefighters was observing the scene was incredible. This is where the, uh, this is an aerial view of it. I've included in my report, uh, there's a homestead building. This, uh, you can see here where the uh, market yard and fields have been. This is uh, a machinery shed that was associated with the market garden period. They had an old smithy that was from the original homestead. And the council uh, had a, a start of the policy of bringing old uh, buildings that were in danger uh, of uh, development. Um, they bought an old school down one side of it uh, there. There you see the freeway and the uh, Allison Road. That's what the building actually looked like. It's interesting that back in the 1890s, a lot of the people uh, spent a lot of time living outdoors, a bit like in Queensland as well. Uh, they had this breezeway joining the two uh, main buildings. This one here is the, they call the Stinson Museum. <coughs> it's two rooms, two large rooms spread down there with these French doors. Uh, the tiles are actually brought in, handmade from Italy. And uh, this here is the, uh, the main section. You've got a parlour there. This uh, is the main doorway. And this is the library. At the back is the uh, kitchen and then there are a couple of rooms at the back that were probably uh, servants' quarters at one stage, but uh, are all used as, for various uh, displays. Over to the uh, left here is Barker's hut or Barker's barn and uh, beside that this is the old smithy and that's the Yarramong Public School building. Uh, Yarramong I think is means place of cedar um, so the main fire, as we uh, 
saw before was uh, in this area here, this is the mine area. I got a map, uh, or not a map, a plan from Wyoming Council, uh, and these are the various parts to it. There's a parlour there, a children's room behind it, that was just, it was probably a uh, dining room, but they um, had a display of children's toys from the 1800s in there. Here's the uh, kitchen. Market gardeners at Pierce Sandy put this uh, toilet uh, block in there, made it out of asbestos, of course. And uh, they also divided the uh, the library into two with uh, an asbestos and this wall. Here's the breezeway. They uh, the pioneer children's wall uh, was really stained glass out of a church with uh, scenes of. Most of the external walls were made of cedar, which uh, is uh, an amazing thing. It's probably why I couldn't really rebuild it easily um, after the fire. And uh, the internal walls were plastered. But unlike mo modern plaster or really old plaster, uh, really old plaster sticks to uh, laths uh, made from split uh, wobble, this one was made of, uh, of perforated cast iron sheets. Each room had um, metal walls and metal ceilings, and so it was like a nine, having a fire in an iron pot. Uh, it, um, it ran out of air very quickly until the, uh, the narrow windows or doors were breached. Each uh, ceiling also had a hole cut for a plaster ceiling raised with vents in it to let uh, the air out, but it would have been very hot. sort of reflected on this over over time. I think John DeHaan said at a conference in Western Sydney quite a few years back that he didn't like um, to get any pre-knowledge of uh, a fire before he actually did the investigation. He was probably you know, going to avoid cognitive bias. But uh, you know, in, in our situations, uh, we haven't got anybody else looking after it for us. So unless you actually get in amongst the crowd very early in the, the scene, uh, they get these people are going to disappear and their everything's with them. So I make it a practice now to uh, actually talk to as many people as I can in the, in the, in the, in the job office or crowd. This photo shows us quite a few things about uh, the fire. So there's no fire in the Stinson Museum or in the parlour, is there? The perforated iron sheets are in the hallway still in place, but the door's gone. The wall, the front wall of the um, of the library's gone uh, in the door. But uh, the sheets in the veranda are uh, still in, in place. The sheets uh, on the wall between the, uh, the library and the breezeway were still in place. children's room and uh, the internal beam of uh, the, on the veranda, those tile roof on the veranda, uh, is still held in place on the uh, Stinson Museum but it's collapsed in the, uh, in the area of the library. So it's all pointing to that as 
thing here of uh, dryness in the uh, last day or two. So at this point, uh, you know, we have a discussion about the photography with the uh, with the, the uh, firefighters. You know, what they can do, what uh, photographs they can uh, take, and uh, where we can get it. And they're the sort of things that we want to get from them. Most people have got uh, uh, phones and it's, you know, it, they, uh, they have to be encouraged to actually use them because they're, they're, you know, you, you've got tunnel vision when you go to these sort of things, haven't you? And unless you actually practice at it and thinking about it, you won't take the photo. That's what uh, <coughs> the scene looked like uh, in the early morning. Nowadays we use drones rather than, uh, you know, this one uh, is just an aerial photo that uh, was taken a month later, but uh, we just uh, show the uh, firefighters what uh, we can actually uh, get from it. You can see here the V pattern in the, uh, in the roof of the Stinson Museum. It's pointing back to uh, the, the doorway. children's room, they're still in place, but the, uh, the sheets of the uh, parlour had actually fallen in at that stage. There was considerable um, uh, fire in the roof very early, and I think that was due to the uh, getting out of the, uh, the ceiling plaster rain. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I've got a drone, it's not particularly good, uh, but uh, our uh, mitigation officer Okay, so when firefighters arrived on scene, that's what it really looked like. It was very dark. Naturally, their priority is to do a size up, any rescue, if there wasn't, and uh, then undertake a suppression strategy. As they were doing the size up, they found quite a lot of evidence and did it very, really well. This is the first bit that they found. So in this, uh, this here is the uh, door beside the uh, rear This uh, rear walk window here of the uh, Stinson Museum. This was the, uh, the room that uh, Oz was on the southern side, uh, furthest away from Breedway, was up at the time and the glass was broken and there appeared to have been a fire on the, uh, 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 on the window sill. And 
they saw underneath the scratch marks consisting of somebody trying to climb in. So I thought that was pretty good in the, in the dark, just about 4.30 in the morning. They went into Stinson 1 to look to see if there was any fire uh, damage. Again, they turned off the lights, so it's dark, uh, no uh, steam. And uh, that's the first one, that was uh, at the letter A. You can see what uh, that is. Yeah, it is blood. <laughs> and this is all burnt. And then under the, uh, this is C, this is uh, under the, the hedge. Uh, again, more blood. And uh, when we turn this over later, it's uh, the significant men Inside the uh, bloodstone pages was this curtain rod. So you can see it's bent and that it's got uh, fire residue up on one end. Now I went looking for uh, uh, curtain rods. The, uh, that's where the curtain rod was found. And the only uh, um, window that was missing a curtain um, was in here. All the
this stage, you know, we've looked at what evidence is on the scene, we say we'll go with, through with the uh, firefighters. We'll go through with the uh, firefighters uh, about uh, finding out what sort of evidence they're looking for, what they'll do. We've, we've been over all this sort of stuff in the protection preserve here to the scene, but uh, we'll just go through that all again. Probably give you a few 20 minute discussion about the pressure. Now, um, also, at that stage, talk about uh, the importance of pictures again. And this was one that was taken by the Araka Situations Officer. I think this was a great move in a large incident like this uh, that uh, the duty officer reported the Situations Officer. It happened to be uh, Inspector Shane Gearan, uh, who's pretty fluent. And he, uh, he took tremendous photos of the scene. Uh, and also of uh, all the evidence in situ. Um, but this one is really good if you if you look at it. Uh, you can see the the wall uh, plates for the external wall of the library. These ones here have fallen, uh, but they were up. And they're all about approximately the same height, except the ones near the uh, the door into the into the foyer. So I uh, excluded it in the sort of a fire origin in that uh, in the breezeway as a result of that and you can see the these are the iron sheets they've all uh, fallen in you can't see the ceiling ones but they're in the top it looks like the ceiling ones caved down like the, the iron um, the plaster burst through there first probably because the, the uh, fire got up into the ceiling through the plaster road and then it all collapsed down and dragged the wall uh, in on top of it. So uh, we encourage them basically if they're going to uh, you know, have to pull the wall down for safety or uh, they can't uh, wait uh, <coughs> for an overhaul until the FI get there that they take uh, numerous photos of uh, the scene so that we've got something to, to work from. So at this stage uh, just go through, I'll go through it and what uh, the IC and the firefighters accomplished in the uh, early stages of this uh, uh, firefighting. And it was uh, quite significant. That's the back of the uh, Vincent Museum up there. So, you know, they conducted an external survey to determine the status of the doors and windows, turned off and over the electricity, there was no gas. Identified objects, secured them, and uh, they determined that the cause was likely to be suspicious and got the uh, fire investigation out uh, very quickly. So, in the late stage, we pretty well, uh, the fire investigation goes with the uh, firefighters basically. And they uh, took photos of parts <coughs> of the structure, like we were, um, like I said, we'll take at this stage we then just uh, give them a little uh, talk about uh, the actual investigation and uh, uh, some of the fire patterns. You can see that the, uh, the rear of the, of the kitchen, <coughs> there's just a fire in the ceiling, isn't there? And not much uh, lower down. So we're looking for the area of greatest uh, and least damage. So VJ, that's where the, uh, um, the wheelie bin was, just outside. That's the broken by heat. You can see they've put a bit of tape along there that so people might not go around and touch the, uh, the windows and doors. That's uh, the window that was actually open and there's the, uh, the box there. The actual uh, fire damage gets lower as you get towards the, uh, the office. And that's the, the window next to it. So we've got a smoke layer down to about that There's the office itself with the damage to the roof facing towards the library. This, uh, they pulled the cedar boards off the doorway uh, there. That was, looks like an old door into that uh, back of the office. This looks like it was a separate room at one stage. There's the uh, children's wall. No glass. But uh, heat rising from there has uh, given it a partial repattern. 
Seen, and that was the benefit of the photo that was there was no fire there anyway mm -hmm. uh, in the early stages. You can see the iron sheets uh, have collapsed in on top of, and then the uh, roof has fallen in on top of that. So there's the office. The uh, foyer is just to the side there. That door. Okay, so ends up we uh, determined that um, the, uh, the foyer in the library was one area of, uh, of fire origin. The people didn't uh, couldn't go much beyond that. Uh, this is damage, and then we looked at the Stinson Museum. This is uh, the door to the off the breezeway, and you can see that this uh, window has been breached. All the cedar cladding has um, disappeared, hasn't it? I don't know if you've had any fires in cedar or western red cedar. They just, uh, it's all, once it starts, it just all smoulders away to, to absolutely uh, nothing. And uh, a bit like uh, burning wattle as well. Once you start it, it'll smoulder for days and leave virtually no ash. So in Stinson 1, this was the, uh, the room. One uh, thing that I talked to the firefighters about is this uh, metal hat box that you can see there. It uh, actually broke that window. And what happened was that uh, there was a cupboard here and there was a little bit of uh, fire in some of the contents above it. And a firefighter walked in doing his little patrol, grabbed the cupboard and threw it over. And the hat box came off and smashed the, uh, the window. And you know, I try to tell the firefighters, if you do something like that, you've got to tell people about it. You know, don't uh, cause damage if you don't have to. Um, luckily, we'd uh, already had information that that window was intact from the, uh, from the, uh, the first survey. So as you can see, the damage was uh, pretty level, most of the, uh, uh, the heat came into the room through that doorway there, and we discounted that as a, uh, an area of fire origin. Stinson 1, with the little fire on the sill, was also um, that was an area of fire origin, numerous little fires in it. So I think as he climbed in the window, he threw these uh, branches <coughs> off. Left uh, quite a little bit of debris in there. He left some blood, and on the floor was uh, this uh, auger. So I checked with the curator again, and that's the auger was actually stored in the smithy. So it looks like uh, the auger was used to break the window. You can see from that the little pattern there that was mechanical damage, wasn't it? And also the smash up. Did a few little fires. It's an odd pattern, isn't it, of, of, of fire lighting? You got any uh, ideas about the person who was doing it? That Not something that you would not see as a juvenile or missing feature. Mm, pretty good. Yeah, yeah, that didn't make it into the 2016 book. A famous figure now. Yep. <laughs> so on the other side of the room, uh, whoever's done it. Uh, opened the door, stuck the curtain in the top and uh, lit the curtain and uh, it's actually uh, been able to remove 
some of the sparks from the inside and also got out and then the fire just smouldered up the, to the roof line. This place had no alarms? Nope. No alarms and a lot of the, uh, of the records hadn't been backed up. This is Barker's barn, or Barker's hut, and uh, uh, it's uh, right on the uh, entrance way was this uh, jacket, naturally. So the bloke's taken off his jacket, so there's the... Uh, it's stealthy, it's quiet, and it's so awesome to hunt. <laughs> So uh, in the um, in the fire region, he's held up uh, a um, some burning material uh, on the side of the fire truck. I did that once to the side of the fire shed when uh, we'd run out of drip torch fuel, and I came back and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get some curtains and uh, wrap that up around some uh, um, uh, Rayco um, handles, and we'll go out and light the fire. But it's a hell of a two post. Uh, and there are all sorts of, there's little bits of curtain material uh, burnt there. Uh, there's fire on the seat. He held fire under the uh, uh, under the dashboard. And he's also put strips of uh, material on top of the, the uh, wheeler for the fire. Mm. And then in front of the, uh, to top it off, in front of the fire engine, he found this curtain. Same sort of curtain things that uh, we found in the, uh, in the building. So, all sorts of good stuff. It's, it still goes on. And uh, I went down to the uh, school and found this uh, display board, which is not a place you'd normally find a display board out in the open. And uh, there wasn't enough fire residue here to really account for the board having burnt. So I looked uh, and asked about where these boards were from. And that, that's them here. They were used as sort of a windbreak in the uh, uh, in the breezeway. And <coughs> it looks like this bloke has actually gone up, grabbed one of these boards and taken that over to the uh, to the school while it was on fire. There were bits of burning um, cover material all across the grass. So there is uh, the window, broken mechanical force again, and more little sticks, and this time he's used some of the cover from the display boards. So all up we had uh, four areas of origin, and uh, the police uh, charged the 38-year-old uh, man uh, over that, which was uh, from the ABC News. Uh, a little uh, the police also reported uh, that a caretaker uh, had actually uh, uh, come at the man with a bit of burning uh, branches the caretaker said I think he's probably jerked him too a man was arrested on the motorway nearby he had no clothes on at all he had uh, cuts and he had, uh, he was bleeding. So, you know, it wasn't a very hard one for uh, the police. Now, just we finish off by uh, looking at the firefighting techniques and the scene preservation uh, that uh, firefighters do. And we just uh, sort of encourage them basically when they're doing that, to keep the use of the jets to a minimum. Uh, when you're searching for fire extension, pull down as little pos as possible, and of course, take photos where you can uh, do it. So 
that's what we do. Oh, I'll be taking around to uh, the local brigades over the next uh, year or so, and we intend to develop other uh, ones to get the people's interest and also to get them back focused on uh, fire investigation. Uh, that's what the museum looks like uh, today. You've still got the stints in the park largely intact, uh, but this has been uh, pulled down and redone. Um, so you so still got have alarms and um, smoke detectors. <coughs> yep, it's still quite a, it's still worthwhile uh, visiting, and uh, it's you, know, uh, you can go to the Barrett factory and the chocolate factory across the road. You're uh, up in Wyong, Allison Road, Kate Road. Oh, he was there forever, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it was there forever. But you can see, uh, if you go back to uh, that uh, map, that uh, without alarms, you could be you could be in there. Uh, I guess there are people. So uh, the, uh, they have um, a, a um, security guard who visits, uh, um, and uh, it is a security guard rather than a caretaker. Uh, they just got it wrong, actually, in the, uh, in the leading. Oh, they're nearly there. Ah, there it is. So you can see, uh, you can see what it is. There are some houses over really once you got in there um, you could be there for hours so Rick, how big is that area of the oh probably uh, that whole area like that is probably sort of two acres two acres uh, it used to be much it says it used to be <coughs> the, the whole of the line which was a historical building um, you got any uh, suggestions or <coughs> questions about it? no question just just The thing that really got me is that this, you know, this man who, who did this had a history of, uh, of contact with the police and, you know, in and out of uh, jail for small stuff, obviously mentally unwell. Five years he's gone through, and it's, uh, you know, you go through this sort of stuff until, you know, you, you uh, finally do something really big. So, you know, as a society, we've really got to value that, um, mental health uh, are more and that um, how are you okay type days and all those sort of strategies uh, are really important. Otherwise we're going to have a lot more of these. Um, Can I just add one other thing? You've said that you've given that John Pratt the record five times. Do you think that he's the best John Pratt that you've ever had? He is, yes. But um, we, I think really problems uh, uh, treated well before it got to this stage. Anyway, yep? Yeah. 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 Oh, uh, significant men in the Central Coast. No, um, I, I believe he was uh, a man of Aboriginal uh, descent, whether he, he came from the area or not. Um, he may have been uh, uh, using those branches or something, you might have been doing a smoking ceremony or something like that. Having the full gun, the concept of actually taking a, a, a case in your local area and using it for a protection service, because we've, we've been rolling this course out for years, and I've actually had to monitor the people who are attending protection service as the people are. Turned out to be good fire investigators, but, um, <laughs> but they it's a great idea to, to take up and put them in some evening courses. So, sorry, yeah, well done. Thank you, Rick. Well, thanks for coming tonight. Uh,